one, um, I'm going to go ahead and before I share my screen, uh, just say, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me back. Um, I've had a great time sharing with you guys, talking about credit, talking about savings. And so in this, we're going to do a, a, a little recap of what we talked about before, but then we want to dive a little bit deeper into this discussion about savings and credit. Um, but we also want to talk about really building wealth, which is really the bottom line. The goal of savings, the goal of credit is building wealth. And so if I could get you guys to start sharing with me in the chat box, tell me what you think wealth is. You're just your definition. You don't have to, I know a lot of students like to hit the chat rather than unmuting yourself. So you can feel free to put it in the chat. If I ask you to give me your definition of wealth, now if you want to come off mute and speak, I'd love that as well. But give me your definition of wealth. How would you define wealth? If somebody says I'm wealthy or you hear about somebody being wealthy, how would you define that? Uh, probably them having a lot of money. And being... Having a lot of money. All right. Uh, and now is, it, is it Caleb? It's Caleb, yeah. Uh, Caleb. All right, Caleb. All right, Caleb, what would you define as a lot of money, Caleb? Just in your in, in your estimation, no right or wrong answer. What would you consider a lot? A million, two million? You have to be Bill Gates. What would you th think, Caleb? Uh, around like, I would say 100,000. 100,000. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. I like it, Caleb. All right. And let me get it here. Uh, Zara says having enough money to be comfortable for the rest of their life and have enough to support their families for generations. So I love, I love both your responses. Okay. Generally in terms of wealth, we're talking about, uh, having a stream of money. Now Zara brought up something very good having enough money for future generations, right? Because wealth is generational. It's not just what you have, but wealth is something you can pass down to other generations. So the question then becomes, how do we build wealth? Does anybody know? Anybody have any ideas? How do you build wealth? If, is, well, first of all, is wealth important? And let me see the hands or hit me in the chat box if you think wealth is important. You'd say, having wealth is something I would like to do in my lifetime. I would like to have wealth for myself, and I would like to have wealth to pass down to future generations. How many say that's important? What about you, Caleb? Yeah, yeah, okay. I would agree. All right, anybody else? Anybody else? Nobody else? Nobody else feels that wealth is important? It's not part of what you have as a, as a long-term goal for yourself? Yeah, it's a goal for myself as well. Okay, all right, Mohammed. all right. And so, Mohammed, let me ask you this. Have you taken any class or seen anything that has taught you how to build wealth? Have you, is there anywhere that you can say, in this class or in this program, I was taught the keys to building wealth? Um, it wasn't exactly a class, but basically my cousin, he does like, um, like investing through like certain apps on his phone and stuff like that. And I just mm -hmm. like tried to learn as much as possible from him. Okay. And I feel like it, it has helped a little. Okay, so you you feel like, or he said he's building well. Uh, yeah. Okay, all right, as much as he can show you, excellent. Okay, anybody else, anybody else have a cousin, friend, a book that you've read? Because a lot of times, especially when you're young in high school, even in college, the focus is of course on getting an income, okay? And so one of the things I wanna distinguish is the difference between income and wealth. Income is important. And the more income you make, the better opportunity you have to build wealth. But they're, they're not one and the same. A lot of people generate income, but never build wealth. And so we have to kind of understand what the difference is in terms of income and wealth. And so income is something you work for. So you have a job and you have a position and you make $80,000 a year. That's your income. But wealth works for you. So in other words, you take some of that income, you live off of some of it, but you put some of it as a down payment for a house, okay? Hopefully that house appreciates in value and later on you can sell it and you take back some of that equity and that's, so you've built wealth in the real estate and now that real estate is able to support you in the future. Let's take owning a small business. So let's say you, you work for a while, but your dream is to be an entrepreneur or you invest in, in a friend or relative that's an entrepreneur and that business does well. So now it gives you a stream of income you don't have to work for, okay? And let's say another way is that you invest in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, a 401k, 
on a job, a 403B, that invests in various companies. And as the market goes up and the price of those shares go up, you now have a source of income in the future that you can draw from without having to physically work, okay? So that's the thing is that with income, the goal is to turn income into wealth. If we take our income and we spend it on things that don't appreciate, don't go up in value, then what happens is, is that we don't have anything that is accumulated later on when we no longer want to work or we can't work. It can't turn into cash for us, okay? It can't turn into an income stream that we can live off of. And it's not something we can pass down to our relative, to our children and grandchildren. It's not something that can be generational. Any questions? All right, so let's jump in and we're gonna pick up here as I share my screen. We're gonna talk about credit and I'm not gonna go through all of it like I did before because I wanna also touch about savings. And if you need, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, go ahead and either raise your hand or hit me in the chat box. So when we talked about credit and we do our virtual webinar, we always talk about setting your goal, okay? So the first thing is, what is my goal? Do I wanna own a home? Do I wanna own a lease a car? Do I wanna qualify for new credit cards? Or do I wanna you know, uh, have credit so that I can, if I need to borrow money to go to college, I can, I can do that as well. But what I want you to understand is after you've picked your destination, what I really wanna do is talk about, jump to this screen here, and this is very important, especially for those of you who are now 18 and over, and you can technically borrow money. You can sign an agreement or a contract. I want to skip all the way past all of this to here. These are the things that make strong credit. And it's important because if your credit is not strong, then you're going to pay higher interest rate. Okay. So let's first talk about where credit is used. Can anybody tell me where, who are some of the people that pull your credit? some of the businesses, some of the things that pull credit. You can either hit me in the chat box or you can unmute yourself. Who looks at your credit? Who, who looks takes a look at your credit? What companies, what organizations? Banks. Banks, exactly, because they're lending you money, correct? Yeah. So they look at your credit to see, do you, are you likely to pay them back? Excellent, I appreciate that, Caleb. So banks look at your credit, any other or so banks and we'll put credit unions in there and finance companies. So lenders look at your credit. Anybody else? Are banks and, and lenders the only ones that pull credit? Um, don't you like a certain amount of like credit to like if you're trying to buy like an expensive house, don't you like a certain amount of credit to be able to buy it? Yes, you need to have a high enough credit score to be able to get a house, a mortgage lender uh, like a bank or other types of lenders. Yes. Very good, Mohammed. They look at your credit. So we have banks and credit unions and lenders look at your credit. But there are other people that pull credit as well. I want you to understand how much credit is used in this country, not just for lending. That's the primary purpose, but other people do too. Does anybody know anyone else that pulls credit beside lenders? Well, I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of hints. There are some companies that pull credit before they offer a job. They may like you in the interview, they may say, you know, your, 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 your experience, your background, your, your education is good, but they may pull your credit prior to making the final offer. Why do you think some companies would want to pull credit? Why would, a, why would a corporation like Capital One or why would a business want to see someone's credit before hiring them? Why do you think? Um, I would say because like, like the reason why someone would have like bad credit would be like if they're maybe like not responsible or something. So like... I they want to check if the person is like reliable enough. Very good. A lot of times lenders look at credit as character. Did you, did you do what you said you were going to do? You borrowed this money. Did you pay it back? Excellent. Anybody else? Why else do you think um, a, uh, a company might pull your credit? Why else would a company consider looking at your credit? So then like there is a lower chance that you can take their money and run off. Ah, very good. If they're trusting you, Caleb, if I'm going to make you the branch manager at this branch and you have access to 100, 200,000, but you're having financial trouble, am I concerned that you might take some money to take care of your debt? So when you, we're, they're entrusting you with resources, when you are going to be responsible and you're going to have money there available. 
Sometimes people won't do things until they get into a desperate situation. Caleb, you're right on the, uh, 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 you hit it right on the button. Let me share some other folks that pull credit. Sometimes also, uh, a lot of times, insurance companies pull credit. They use it to calculate your premium. And landlords, companies that are going to rent you an apartment will pull your credit. Uh, my son is, is, is down at Virginia Tech and uh, he's getting a new place. He and his, his roommates are moving into a four bedroom apartment. Um, I had to co-sign because he doesn't really have much credit and he doesn't have any income, he's a student. So guess what they did? They pulled my credit because I'm the person who's standing behind it. They wanna know, am I likely to pay that money for the lease? So do you see how many different places and how credit can impact you? Do you see how, how credit can impact your life? Imagine if you did a great job on the interview, knocked it out the park, they loved you, they said, hey, listen out, we're gonna be sending you something very soon. And then they pull the credit and they say, sorry, we can't make you an offer. Or you've gotten that new job, you're so excited, you've moved to the new city, you gotta find a place to live, and now all of a sudden what? Every other place that you've gone to, several of the landlords said, sorry, can't rent that to you. So I want you to understand how important credit is so that you can understand why you need to maintain good credit. Or if you don't have credit yet, like most of you, you know how to build it and why it's so important to take care of it, okay? Because it can take up to 10 years, seven years for most things, but as long as 10 years for something to come off of your credit. Okay, so if you damage your credit at 18, it may not come off of your credit till you're 25 or 28. Okay, any questions? All right, so let's talk about what makes up good credit. The first thing is payment history. So that's how often you're paying. Are you paying every month on time? Are you paying consistently? That's the number one factor in good credit, okay? And I've seen, oh, I forgot another one. This is one that's gonna be important to you guys. Cell phone companies, as well as some utilities will pull credit as well. Sometimes they'll pull your credit before they'll set you up on a plan where you're paying each month for your cell phone, okay? So that's another area that you can uh, run into problems. If your credit's not good, they may not approve you to pay over 12 months or 18 months for that new iPhone or new Android, okay? So number one issue or number one item that impacts your credit is payment history, okay? Number two is credit utilization. So in other words, when you first come out of school or you get that first credit card uh, that you have, you wanna stay below 30% of the credit limit. So let's say they give you a thousand dollar limit. That means you don't wanna charge above $300 on that credit card. Even though your limit is a thousand, you don't wanna go above $300 because if you go above 300, then your credit score is gonna to start to suffer, okay? It's gonna go down, okay? So payment history and credit utilization are the number one and number two things that make up your credit history. They make up 35% of your credit history. So if you, if, you, if you don't understand how both of these things work, it's gonna be very hard for you to have good credit, okay? Any questions? Any questions on anything we've talked about so far? Well, credit, what makes up your credit? Um, can, can you increase your credit score by not even touching your own credit card? Yes, you can, uh, Wil Wilbur. Uh, you can do it if, you're make, if you have, say, debt outstanding and you're paying on it each month, Wilbur, then your score will go up because it's going to report that you're paying on time. So let's say, Wilbur, you have a car loan and you have a credit card but you're not using the credit card because you say, I'm only gonna use it for emergencies on that car loan as you pay every month, that finance company, that bank's gonna report it and therefore your score will go up, Wilbur, based on that, that, that car loan that you have. So you don't have to use the credit card. Now, what I generally recommend is using it and getting a small amount on there just so it stays active. So you go fill up your tank, Wilbur, and then when the bill comes, you pay it off. Okay, so you just use it for a small amount and pay it off. But let, let's say you have an installment loan, like a car loan, okay? Because there's only two types of things on your credit report. Revolving, which are things like credit cards, home equity lines, and overdraft protection. Revolving just means as you pay it down, it's available to you again. 
You don't have to take out a new loan. That's what it means by revolving. It revolves. If I pay down my card from $600 on the balance down to zero, all of my limit is available to me again. With an installment loan, like a car loan or student loan, you make fixed payments every month. And when that loan matures and it's paid off, that's it. If you want more money, you have to go back and borrow. So installment and revolving, those are the two things on your credit report. So to answer your question, Wilbur, yeah. If you have other things reporting, such as a student loan, car loan, personal loan, uh, and you don't touch your credit card and you're paying on time, yes, your score will go up over time, okay? Great question, all right? So the other thing is credit history. And that's just how long have you been in the credit bureau, okay? Now, what some parents will do is they'll make their children an authorized user on their credit card when they're younger and let them begin to take advantage of or build their credit history based on the parent's credit, okay? So the credit history is based on when you enter the credit bureau. So most of you who haven't built any credit yet, once you get your first piece of credit, that's when your credit history will start, okay? For others, maybe a parent has uh, put you on as an authorized user, so you're already building some credit using your parent's credit. Now, for others, a parent may have to co-sign. And let's talk about what co-signing is. Let's use my friend Wilbur. Wilbur decides he wants to buy uh, a used car right out of school. He's gotten a great job working as a chemical engineer, or no, no, Wilbur's more of an electrical engineer. So Wilbur is an electrical engineer working for a company. He decides he wants to get a used car, doesn't need anything fancy because engineers tend to be a little conservative. And so, but when Wilbur goes, they say, well, you don't really have any credit. He hasn't established any credit. So Wilbur can get a family member who may say, I will co-sign for you. That means you'll get the car. I will use my credit and my credibility to back you up. So the bank or the lender will say, okay, because we have somebody else, who if you don't pay, they will pay or will they'll be responsible and we see their credit is strong, we're willing to help to go ahead and make this loan for you. I did that with my daughter when she graduated from school. I co-signed for her car loan so that she could get the best rate possible. I knew she'd pay, but I also made sure if she didn't, I could pay. So that's another way that, that you can uh, get your credit established or as you're, as you're trying to get your credit established, be approved by someone else co-signing for you, okay? Any questions on that, on credit history or co-signing? All right, so the next two things, the last two things that make up your credit history is new credit, okay? That's how much new credit you've taken out, how many new loans, how many new lines, that's 10%. So it's not a big portion, but it is important. You only wanna borrow money for your needs, not your wants, okay? Too often people will use a credit card or take out a loan and they may take out a loan for a vacation. They may use their credit cards to go buy, you know, some clothes that maybe they needed one or two things, but because they wanted to just splurge, they spent way more than they really needed to. Okay. So we always want to borrow for our needs, not our wants. Okay. Credit mix. That's the mix of different types of credit. Remember I told you there's installment and revolving Wilbur. So the credit mix looks and says, we the, the, the algorithm, the, the computation says, we'd like to see that, that Wilbur is not only paying on his car note, but we'd like to see that periodically he charges on his credit card and pays it back. That'll help maximize your credit score, okay? They like to see that you have a mix of both revolving and installment on there. Any, any questions on the five ingredients that make up a strong credit score, anybody? Let me ask this question. Has anybody, has anybody established credit already or seen a copy of their credit score? Has anybody ha had to borrow money or established any credit so far uh, uh, on there? Is, or is everybody still totally green to credit and have not even seen your score and not established any credit? I haven't established it yet. Okay. I'm still green. All right. Totally fine. You're young enough. You don't have to. There just might be someone who maybe, you know, they had a job. And that's one thing also I want to caution you about. Many of you, when you go to college during the summer, you're going to work. Some of you will have internships and you'll be making a nice set of change. You'll be making some good money. Be very careful as you're approached and you get solicitations to open and get credit cards 
that you don't base your payments on what you're working for in the summer. What do I mean by that? Well, you say, well, I got this credit card and it gave me a $500 limit or a $1,000 limit or $750. I'm going to put $400 on it and then I'm going to pay it off this summer. But then I'm going to put another three, $400 because they're different things I want. What's the problem with putting money on a credit card or putting charges on a credit card and basing it on the income you're earning during the summer? Can anybody tell me what, what would be the drawback or what's the danger of saying, well, I, I got this credit card and then I got this other one and then I got this other, I got my car note and I can make all the payments while I'm working during the summer. What do you think is the danger if you can, if you do that, you run your debt up based on the money you're making during the summer? Um, like, can you oh. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Mariana, and then I'll come back to you, Muhammad. Go ahead, Mariana. I'm not sure, but is it that interest can rise over the summer and then you're gonna have to pay more than you were supposed to? Well, it's not that the interest can rise, you're gonna pay interest, especially if you don't pay it off. You're right that interest is gonna accrue on the loans and that you have, and you're gonna have, you know, you're gonna have to pay that off. But there's another reason that you shouldn't base it on you know what you're making during the summer go ahead Muhammad. um i was gonna say like like certain events can happen in your life that could like like let's say you get sick or something or like a family member gets sick and they need money and like mm -hmm. you wouldn't be able to like help yourself or them if you don't like if you're expecting to make and spend the same amount of money you wouldn't have any other money to like you like i'm not sure how to explain it, but like you wouldn't have any money to like be flexible and like stuff like that Right. You can't help other people out. So you can't put aside some savings. Very good. You can't put aside savings to help anybody out. One more reason, though. One more reason. Think about it. You're making a certain amount of money because you're working 40 hours, maybe even 50 hours during the summer. But now the fall comes. What's going to happen? Your payment source isn't sustainable, so you're not going to be working 40 hours during the summer. Like Be Bethel, you're a banker. Exactly. Say that again. Say that. You're very quiet. Say that again. A little louder for so everybody can hear you. You're perfectly co correct. Your payment source isn't sustainable throughout the fall than it is in the summer. Exactly. You're in school. You're not going to work 40 hours. Great job, Bethel. You're not going to work 40 hours when you when you go back to school. Now, all of a sudden, you were getting a check that was like $800 every two weeks. Maybe the, the job is even in your, in where you, back home where, you're, uh, you know, where you live. And when you go back to school, you're not even working there. You're working on campus. Now, all of a sudden, your paycheck goes from $800, $900 every two weeks to maybe you've got a little part-time, 10-hour-a-week work-study job, and your paycheck's $80. But you've based your spending off of the, what you worked on with that summer. And now all of a sudden, the credit card says, we want $50, but your paycheck's only 80. And then the, uh, uh, the other loan or the other credit card says, we want $35. And you got a new iPhone or a new uh, Samsung and, it, and you got the payments and it was $70 a month for the next 12 months or, four, or 18 months. And you're like, I can afford that because I'm making $800 every two weeks. That's great. But then when August rolls around and then you go back to school and you can't work that many hours, guess what? Now you're in debt and you're based all of your spending on what you were making during the summer. Now, how many of you think a lot of adults and young people make that mistake? Not just with the summer. How many of you think that that's a common mistake that people make? They base their, in, their spending off of an income that they're not gonna be able to maintain. Do you think that happens quite often? What do you think, Bethel? You gave such a great answer. What do you think? Um, yeah, I think people like think a lot in the moment and not about like the debt that's gonna come along with it. Bethel, you've gotta be about 80 years old. You've got the wisdom of somebody who's way older, exactly. Thinking in the moment, they live right now based on, okay, right now I'm making this, and this is how I'm going to live. And I'm not even worried about things changing, okay? And Muhammad brought up another good point. Let's say I'm making that kind of money and I can afford to pay it, but I don't save any. And then something else critical comes along. A family member uh, needs help with something. And, and I and instead of being able to help them, I'm like, man, I spent all that money I made this summer and I really would love to be able to help my cousin because uh, she's in a really difficult situation. 
or I'd like to help my younger brother or my older brother or my aunt, you know, whomever it is, I'd really like to be able to help them. But man, I ran through all that money and now I still have debt. And guess what? And this is a reality. I want, I really want to share with you guys what really happens in your mind that debt can take you away from your studies. You know, you're thinking, oh my gosh, how, how am I going to do this? So here's what you, you, you think about doing. I'm going to work more hours during the school year. I'm not just going to work 10 because I can balance my, 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 my studies with that. I'm going to go ahead and find another part-time job or try to get my hours up to 20 or 30, go somewhere else. Maybe they'll only let me work 10 on campus, but I find a job that'll let me work 20, 25 hours in the evening. Now, what's the problem with that? I'm doing 10 hours on campus, but I'm getting another 25 hours during the week uh, working out, working somewhere else in the evening. What do you think is that, how, what kind of problem does that create when I'm in college? Takes time away from your studies. Exactly. And what do you do? What are you in school to do? To study. To study. Yeah. Ah, you said that kind of, you were hesitant there, Muhammad. You sure you're in there to study? Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. You're there to study. Your goal is to get your degree. Your goal is to accumulate the knowledge. Yes, you may have to work some, but if you're working 35 hours and you're going to school and you're having to do projects and you have to do turn in papers and so forth, it can become very difficult. And then all of a sudden, school takes a back seat. Now, all of a sudden, your, your grades are not where they need to be, okay? And so that can create a ripple effect. So we don't want that to happen. Very good, great answer, guys, very good, okay? So we talked about what are the two, really these are the three most important factors in your credit. Repaying const consistently and on time, staying under 30% of your credit utilization, and keeping your oldest account active. So for most of you, you do not have any credit yet and that's perfectly fine. But as you get older and once you get into school and maybe even after you graduate, you're going to need to build credit. So it's important for you to understand how do I do that? And what are the things that I need to do to keep my credit as strong as possible? What are the things that I need to do, okay? All right, I'm gonna stop sharing this for a second and then I'm gonna go to the next slide. Any other questions? Any questions on credit before I jump to savings? I want to talk about savings, how savings ties in with credit and why it's important, okay? I have a, I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Caleb. Uh, if it's like, a, if it's a problem that people spend money as soon as, they, as soon as they get it, like why doesn't the school like give you a course on like how to spend your money so they don't do that? Very good question, Caleb. I don't even think, you tell, when you say school, I think it ought to be taught from the time you're in, in middle school. I agree, like from middle school, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, there ought to be a course on basic finance. There ought to be a course on uh, credit. There ought to be a course on investing. You've asked a very good question, Caleb, and I don't have an answer for it. Unfortunately, financial literacy is not taught in our curriculum. There may be one or two school systems that have a little something on it, but most school systems have no information or education on financial literacy. So Caleb, what do you think happens to a large number of people who come out of college or some who just come out of high school and now they get all of these advertisements and they have opportunities to get credit? What do you think happens to them if nobody's taught them? What do you think happens to a lot of people with regard to not only their credit, but building wealth and so forth? What do you think happens? Uh, like Beth said, that, that they're going to ruin their future because they're going to be like piling up debts after debts. And... Exactly. A lot of them pile up a lot of debt. And you know what they say to me, Caleb? Because I talk to those people. I teach. I don't normally teach students like yourselves. I'm always excited to have this opportunity. But you know what they say to me, Caleb? They say, I wish you were there when I was 17. I wish I could have talked to you when I was 18. Because now they're 35, 40 years old and they, they've damaged their credit. They aren't able to do some of the things they wanted to do, okay? And so they always say to me, I wish I was here when, you know, <laughs> Wendy says that's one of the main reasons CDI covers this in our curriculum. That's why CDI is great. A lot, most curriculums don't cover this, Caleb. What you guys are getting, I talk to 50-year-olds, 40-year-olds, people in all walks of life. And the first thing they say to me is, after we go through the same type of thing I'm talking to you about, building wealth, credit, savings, you know, investing, they say to me, wow, I really could have used that when I was 18. I really wish you would have been there when I was 20 because now they've made mistakes. They've damaged their credit. They've had to pay high interest rates. 
Okay. I didn't show it to you there, but I did. One of the stories is about a gentleman who has to pay 20% interest for his car loan versus a young lady who pays 3.99%. He ends up spending $3,000 more in interest than she did. Simple, same car, same amount borrowed, but he had to spend $3,000 more. Okay. And it's the same thing when you talk about getting a house. If you can't, you know, if you don't have the best credit, you may get declined, first of all, and you can't even borrow. But even if you get approved, you have a higher interest rate, which means more money you put out. The more money you pay out, Caleb, that's the less money you can save. That's, a, that's money you can't invest. That's money you can't use to become wealthy. You're making somebody else wealthy. Your goal, Caleb, and everybody on this line, your goal should be to make yourself wealthy first. That's not selfish. In other words, I'm going to study hard. I'm going to understand and acquire a good or well-paying job. Uh, that's my income. And I'm going to acquire the knowledge to turn a great portion of that income into wealth so that at the end of the, my time working, my wealth can then work for me and it can pay me back. And if I've built enough wealth, I can leave some for my children, my grandchildren. That's what you want to do. But most places don't teach it, Caleb. So most people go into their 20s and 30s and 40s and they have no idea about credit. They just do it by trial and error. They run up credit cards. They don't know that if you go above 30%, you're going to get dinged on your credit. Okay. They don't know that they shouldn't close their oldest credit card. And then the things I'm about to share with you here about savings, they go, I don't know how to save. Saving is hard. Well, I'm going to teach you how to make savings not easy, you know, because it always takes some discipline. Okay. Now, let me, before I jump into savings, share something with you guys about a story. Has anybody ever heard about the marshmallow theory? Anybody ever study or hear about the marshmallow theory? All right. When you get a chance, go look it up, but I'll share with you what it was. Some scientists, I think it's back in the 50s, did a study on students and they told them, okay, basically they gave the students a choice. And these kids were like maybe, maybe kindergarten, first grade. And they said, you can have like maybe three marshmallows now, right now, if you want it. But if you wait till after the class, you will be able to get twice as many marshmallows, okay? So now, Caleb, you're up on my screen. I'm giving you that choice. And let's they say it's not marshmallows. Let's say, what's, what do you like to eat, Caleb? Let's pick something else. Pizza. Huh? Pizza. All right. So, Caleb, here's the, here's the option I'm going to give you. You can have a slice of pizza right now. Or if you wait till after, let's say it was the beginning of the presentation. If you wait till after the presentation, now you're hungry though, Caleb, you can get two slices of pizza. A piece right now, because you're hungry and, you're, and you haven't eaten all day. But if you wait 45 minutes to an hour till after the lecture, you could have two slices. Which one would you choose? I'd probably wait. Okay, you'd probably wait, okay? How many people would wait? How many people, let me see in the chat box, how many people would wait like Caleb? How many people would take this? Now you're starving. How many would take the two slices of pizza? I should say, get the one slice and not wait for the second slice. I would wait too. All right, Zara. All right, everybody will wait. Kimberly, what do you say, Kimberly? You would wait too? All right, well, here's what, what they found out. Yes, okay. The kids who wanted to take the marshmallows right then, they weren't willing to uh, wait. In other words, they weren't, it's called deferred gratification that when they followed those students years later versus the students who chose to wait, like Zara did and Caleb, okay? All right, those, oh, here's the video. Okay, great, Wendy's put it up there. The kids who waited and deferred gratification, in other words, they said, this is something I want now, but if I wait, it'll be better later. The students who did that, who waited, did far better in school, in education, and in life because they were able to delay gratification. They said, right now, this is something that might be good. But if I wait, there's better for me if I wait. So how does that work? It means that, yes, I could go ahead and you know maybe try to spend money in the summertime and work two jobs during, you know, work two jobs during the, the fall and my grades fall and maybe I flunk out. Or I can say, you know what, I'm just going to be disciplined and not spend like that because I'm here to get my college education. Okay, I'm here to get my degree. 
And so I'm going to put off the spending so I can focus on my schoolwork. Now, if you have to work, I had to work when I was in school, but I only worked a certain number of hours, okay? So I could focus on my studies. Now, some people can't do that. And if you have to, it's totally understandable. But what it shows is that when you're willing to delay gratification, people that are able to do that, they oftentimes are way more successful in life than people who are not able to delay it, who say, I have to have it now. I want to take advantage of it right now. I'm not willing to wait. I'm not willing to, you know, uh, do without. And the reason is, is that people who think like that, and it was, um, um, I forgot who, I forgot the names now. Uh, give me one second here. Wanted to go back. Uh, that's what I'll have it here. Bethel, that's who it was. I want to remember who said it. Bethel said it very good, is that when you're willing to delay gratification and you're willing to not live in the now, just be conscious of right now, you're able to put off. Then you say, you know what? I know it's a sacrifice, but four years from now, I'll have my degree. And then if I go to grad school two years from now, I'll have that degree. And then I'll be able to make sufficient income. And then I'll be able to save enough to build wealth. So when you are able to delay gratification, and it works in a lot of areas, when you go and you decide, okay, you know what, I really should go to the gym or I should exercise. And no, I'm going to sit on the couch and, 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 and binge watch um, you know, something on Netflix. Those who are able to say, I'm going to go to the gym. I know I'd rather just sit here and binge watch but I'm gonna go spend 45 minutes in the gym. Those individuals who are able to delay gratification and say, I'm gonna do what I need to first, the studies have shown over the course of their lives, they tend to be more successful. How many of you think that's true? Or you think I'm making it up? You can say, I, I, you, we think you're making it up, that they just brought me on here to tell you that. How many of you think that's true, that people who can delay gratification end up more successful? I think it's true. It makes sense, so it's probably true. Okay, all right, it is. It, it, it's, a, it's one of the biggest ways that you can determine that they found to be able to tell people who are ultimately more successful because they're able to think in long-term. Bethel says it's very true. And if Bethel says it's very true, you can bank on it. You guys are on a, your great path. So let's talk a little bit about savings and then I'll open up uh, for any other questions that you might have, okay? Uh, Rizmika says, I think it's 100% true, but I have a question. What are great strategies to think long-term instead of short-term? Rizmika, thank you. What are great strategies to think long-term instead of short-term? Very good. All right, let's, talk, let's start with the first one, okay? The first one is who you surround yourself with. If I surround myself with people who have a long-term outlook, okay? So I'm friends with Caleb. I'm friends with Muhammad. And all Caleb talks to me about is, wow, you know what? I, I'm looking forward to going to medical school, okay? And Muhammad talks to me about, wow, you know, when I get my engineering degree, I can't wait because there are some companies I really want to work internationally for because there's some things I really think I can do with that. And I hear those types of thoughts and I don't have people around me who are like, hey, let's do this. Don't worry about it. We, it it'll be fine. When I have those kinds of people around me, I tend to think long-term as well. So when I surround myself with peers, that's people my age, and adults who think long-term, I tend to think long-term, you know? So let's say Caleb comes out and he's got his, he, he's, a, he's a doctor and, um, you know, Muhammad's an engineer and I'm friends with them. And I say, hey, Caleb, man, you, you're driving a used car. I know you're making really you're making big bank, you're making big money, you know, why are you driving a used car? Why are you, you know, bringing your lunch? And Caleb says to me, Sean, in two years, I want to own my own home. I don't want to keep paying rent. And then I go to Muhammad and Muhammad says, you know what? I only want to work for this company five years. I'm like, Muhammad, you're making great money. I know you're making six figures. And he says, yeah, but I only want to work for this company for five years. Okay because I want to own my own engineering firm. And then I talk with Bethel and Bethel is like, yeah, I'm, I'm putting 12%, I'm maxing out my K plan. So I don't have as much money to spend. And you know, I say, Bethel, let's go hang out. Let's go out to dinner, spend money. It's like, no, mm -mm. I, I've got a limited budget for spending. I'm like, Bethel, you've got 
two master's degrees. You make a lot of money. Why aren't you spending it all and living, you know, out of control? And Beth was like, no, I really have a significant plan that I'd like to be retired by the time I'm 38. I'm like, 38? She's like, yep, I've done the calculation. If I put 12% in my K plan and they match me at 6% and I minimize my other expenses and I pretty much have my house paid off by the time I'm 38, maybe 48, if, if I push it, I can just be done. I can have a million dollars put aside. And so each of them is delaying gratification. And so what happens is if I have those kinds of people around me, guess what, Rosmika? I tend to delay gratification. I tend to go, hmm, wow, if all my friends or the people around me, the people who are closest to me, won't be all your friends, if they're thinking like that, it begins to influence my thinking, okay? So that's one way. The other way is that I start to write a vision chart. Anybody ever know what a vision chart is? It's basically where you put up all of your goals and you put them visually so you can see them. So Caleb, tell me one of your long-term goals, just in general. Tell me what, what's, what's a goal or a dream that you have long-term. And when I say long-term, it could be in 10 years, it could be eight years. Well, what's a dream of yours? Retire at an early age. All right, retire. Did you just come up because I said that uh, Bethel was going to retire at 38? Are you trying to steal Bethel's retirement? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. So <laughs> and you like it. All right. I love yeah. it too. All right. So what Caleb might do, Caleb, where would you want to retire to? Is there any place that you'd want to go and live if you retire? Probably Seattle. Seattle. Okay. So what Caleb does is he has pictures of the Seattle Mariners, Seattle Seahawks, and the city of Seattle. And he's got he's got himself on a boat sitting in, in the in right in the water of Seattle. And he's got that picture up. And what he does, he puts it on his screensaver. He's got a picture up like that right there and on his refrigerator. And every day he gets up, he sees visually what he wants to do. He sees and he embeds in him what he wants to. So when we get to savings, and believe it or not, I'm talking about savings right here. So it's the reason that Caleb is able to save significantly, okay? Muhammad, give me a long-term goal of yours. Great job, Caleb. Muhammad, give me a long-term goal that you have. Um, to own my own business someday. All right. So what Muhammad does, Muhammad wants to own, I'm going to go with an engineering firm for Muhammad. So Muhammad has a picture. Maybe Muhammad has an uncle or a relative or just somebody and he thinks about owning his own business. So what Muhammad does, he has a picture of his own small business. But what he also does is he goes and he, he interviews small business owners. So he finds out what did they do. So now he has that knowledge. So the next way is to have a vision and to talk to people who have done what you want to do. OK, because then it becomes real to you. So have a pictorial a pictorial vision or, 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 or something that's visual so you can see it every day. So Muhammad gets up every day and he goes to work at the engineering firm he's working for. But every night he comes home as he opens his refrigerator to go ahead and, and grab something to eat. He sees that picture and he kind of just taps it and touches it. And he says to himself, one day that's going to be mine. One day that's going to be mine. And so in his mind, every time he sacrifices, He's sacrificing not just for anything in general, but he's sacrificing for that business. He can taste it. He can touch it. Okay. And so that's a couple ways. Did I answer your question, Rosmika? Does, does that answer your question about a couple ways to think long term and not just short term? Having good people around you who are thinking long term, getting a visual idea of what you want and putting it so you can see it, and then talking to people who have achieved what you want to achieve and hearing how they did it. That'll excite you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that was really great advice. Thank you. Okay, all right, excellent. Great, great question though. All right, so let's talk about savings and then get ready to open for questions. So a couple minutes. So savings can prevent a problem from becoming a crisis. It can also keep you from debt spirals. So I wanna to talk to you about three types of savings, okay? So you're making money, you're working. There's rainy day savings, that's for unexpected expenses. So let's say you have a car and all of a sudden you get a flat tire. That's what the rainy day is for. It's like, oh man, I don't have the money in my paycheck, but that's fine. I've got $1,000 in my savings. I'll go and buy a new tire. Don't want to do it, but I've got the money to do it. So, I, I, so my car is not you know, out of commission, okay? 
Then you have emergency savings. That's bigger than your rainy day savings. That's the money that you're putting aside that just in case you lose your job or they cut back on your hours, you can still cover all your expenses. Most experts say for rainy for emergency savings, you want to grow that to three to six months worth of expenses. So if your monthly expenses are $3,000, you want to have maybe $9,000 saved up in your emergency savings. And then targeted savings are for planned expenses like school, holidays, or putting a deposit on a new home. So the targeted savings, you're saying, I'm putting this money away, but I have a goal for it. I want to spend it to buy a new house. Or this is money that I'm putting away. Let's say you're working in the summer. Your targeted savings is this is money to spend during the school year. I need to put some money aside because maybe my parents can only help me so much. And so I need to work during the summer. So I've spended spending money during the fall. That's what targeted savings are. Okay. And let's talk about the best way to do it. Okay. The best way to save is first of all, to set a savings goal or plan. But the best way is always after you've set a goal and chosen a plan, I want to skip past this, okay, is to do it regularly. So every day that you get paid during the summer, every paycheck, you want to set up with your, with your, uh, with the company, you want to say, put half my paycheck in my checking, but put the other half in my savings. So you never even see it. Okay. That's called paying yourself first. It's one of the most powerful ways to save money. You don't even see it. It goes directly into your savings and the other half goes into your checking and you spend that and live off of that, okay? And so if you can do that during the summer, say 50, 60% of your income, you're gonna be in great shape come the fall, okay? You always wanna pay yourself first. You always wanna make savings a priority. Don't say, okay, I'm gonna pay all my bills and expenses and then whatever's left over, I'm gonna save. Very few people are able to save successfully that way. The most successful savers pay themselves first. They have it come out off the top and then they live off the rest, okay? And some people live by what's called a, a, a 20, 20, uh, 60 budget. They put 20% for long-term investments, 20% in short-term investments, and they live off of 60%. Those are people who are committed to trying to retire early, okay? And so they may save literally 20% of their money. The other thing, and some of you may have heard of it, when you work a job, you have what's called a 401k. That comes off at the top. Before you even see it, that money comes out of your paycheck. So you're, what you're left with, that's what you can spend. And that's the most powerful way to save. Have it come out first and then live off the rest, okay? All right, so let's just see an example of how quickly money can grow. So for example, if somebody has a, a, a weekly goal of saving $100, at the end of the year, they'll have over $5,000. And that does not include interest that accrues on it. Now, savings accounts don't pay a lot of interest today. So it's not going to be a lot of interest. But you can save, if you save $50 every week, you can have $5,000, okay? I mean, excuse me, you can have $2,500 at the end of a year, if you save $100 every week, you could have over 5,000 saved, okay? So it adds up. And then when you start talking about investing, like in your 401k, going into stocks and other things, you get what's called compounded interest, okay? So not only does your money earn money, but the money it's earned, earns money on top of that. Compounded interest is one of the most powerful laws and rules that you can, that's out there. And when people understand and put compounding interest to work for them, they're able to save a significant amount of money, okay? In fact, there's a rule, I'll give you this rule, it's called the rule of 72. It's a financial rule. Those of you who go into finance will hear the rule of 72. What the rule of 72 means is if you take a number, however long it takes for that number to go into 72, will tell you how many years it takes for your money to double. So let me give you an example. If I'm earning 8% on my investment, if I have $100,000 in an account and it's got compounded interest and it's earning 8% a year in nine years, because eight times nine is 72, 
that 100,000 will double to 200,000, okay? If I keep earning 8% on that money in another nine years, that 200,000 will double to 400,000 and so on and so on. If I'm able to earn 12% on my money, then my money over the course of six years, because 12 goes into 72 six times, in six years, my money will double, okay? And so what I want you to take away from this is when you discipline yourself, and as my friend Bethel said, you understand and don't live for now, but have a long-term view, and you make savings a priority, when you start to make an income, you save first, invest first, and live off the rest, along with the power of compounded interest, many of you could be retiring in your late 30s. It's very possible. Some of you in your early 40s. If you're committed to working hard, investing aggressively, and being very disciplined, it is possible. That's it. I, I want to leave a couple minutes. I've got 553. Any questions? Any questions on anything I've covered so far on credit, on savings, the way you save, on investing, on building wealth, or anything in general on finance that I may not have covered? Um, I had a question on credit. Sure. So when you said uh, about the credit card thing, you said not to go above 30% of the limit. Mm -hmm. So like, is there like a reason why it's like specific, like 30%? And like, why did they make it like that? Very good question. Excellent question, Muhammad. Because that, there's an algorithm that's in the credit card calculation. And what they found is when people go above 30% of their credit card limits, when they start to get to 50, 70, 80%, th there's a greater risk. In other words, they're becoming a greater risk. When people run their credit cards up to 80, 90%, there's a greater risk that they may miss a payment. So they become a greater risk. I, that, that's just how the algorithm, it sounds very low, I know, but that's just how the algorithm calculates it. They found, and I'm sure it's based off of millions and millions of examples, but they've just found that when people go above 30% of their limit, uh, they tend to become a much greater riskier person. And as they get close to 100%, there's a greater risk of what we call default. They don't pay it at all, or they, or they stop paying. So for whatever reason, that's what, they, that's what they've chosen. Good question. So uh, uh, said she's always wondered the same thing. Yeah. So if someone uh, like, like if someone like uses more than 30% and it pays it back, like, do they still like, does it still uh, hurt their credit or? Great question. You guys have excellent questions. What happens, Muhammad? Let's say I go above 30% because I have to get a plane ticket uh, for my cousin. And I don't really have the money right now. And that plane ticket's very expensive. Let's say it's a round trip ticket for $800 and I have a $1,000 limit. So now at $800, Muhammad, I'm at 80% of my limit. What's gonna to happen to my credit score? It's gonna suffer. Right, but let's say in a month or so, my cousin says he'll give me the money back, but it's gonna be a while. But in a month or so, I get a bonus from my job and I pay that 800 back down to zero. The next time it reports on my credit bureau, my score will jump back up, okay? So it's not permanent, but once I get it down below 30 and then ultimately down below 10, I get a big jump at 30. But if you get it down below 10% of your credit limit, your score will go up there too. But that's what will happen. It'll bounce back up. It's not the same, Muhammad, as a delinquent payment. That can stay on for months and even years. When you go above your credit limit, as soon as you get back down below 30% and then ultimately down below 10% or pay it off, once that reports back and shows that your limit is down, you'll see your score bounce back up. Excellent question. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, if you mishandled your credit and then you have a lot of debt and then you have a child, does some of that debt goes to the, go to the child if you can't pay it? No, no. Children are not responsible for the debt of their parents. Uh, as if that child has not signed any agreements, as if the child is under 18, they can't agree to it anyway. But no, you, that, that child is not responsible for any debt of the parents. No. Okay. Great question. Great question. Anybody else? Um, I have another question. Sure. So if I want to buy a car, could I use mm -hmm. my dad's credit since like he could like co-sign me or something? Yes. Your dad can co-sign for you. And that would help you maybe get approved and maybe get even the better interest rate.
because for example, if you have limited credit, you might get approved, but they may give you a higher interest rate because you're greater risk. But if your dad uh, can co-sign for you, yes, that can help you get it. That, that's what I did for my daughter. When she came out of school, she really hadn't established any credit. So we went down to the credit union that I'm a part of. Uh, speaking of which, I recommend having both a bank and credit union. I work for Capital One, which is a bank. I have a Capital One account, but I also have a credit union account. Credit unions are nonprofits, okay? And they, um, uh, they compete with banks, but they also have good options. So sometimes my credit union offers a better rate, but sometimes the bank offers a better rate. So we went down to the credit union. They had a great rate on a used car loan. And so my daughter applied, I applied, I'm co-signer. And what a co-signer means is I'm putting my credit and my uh, up here, but I'm not getting the benefit, okay? You're driving the car, I'm not getting the benefit. That's different than a co-applicant. Co-applicant means we're both getting the benefit. So let's say Sarai, you and your sister both wanna get a car and you both apply, she's the co-applicant, okay? If you're gonna drive it and she's gonna drive it. If your dad's buying the car and it's your car, you're gonna drive it, he is generally acting more. He could be a co-applicant, but he's really acting more um, as a co-signer. He's not getting the benefit of the thing that you're both putting your credit up for, okay? Great question. Does that answer your question? Yes. And for that, I will need to be 18, right? Yes. Well, you generally, yes, you have to be 18 for you to apply. And that's because you have to be of legal age to enter into an, a contract or agreement. If you're not of legal age, you technically can't sign an agreement. So yeah, they won't let you until you're 18. Now, a parent though, can add a child who's under 18 as an authorized user. Okay. All right. Take care, Wendy. Uh, a, a child under 18 can be uh, added as an authorized user, uh, but they're not applying for credit. They're just being authorized to use it and get the benefit of the parent's credit, but they're not applying. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? I have a question about savings. Uh huh. So ahead, I Alan. mentioned earlier, you can take half money into the checking and then half of the money into the savings. Mm -hmm. Can we determine um, how much money will go into the, the, three the three types of savings that you've mentioned? Or do they all just go um, equally into those? Well, very good question. So most people, I generally don't recommend having all three. You can. I would recommend having an emergency slash rainy day one and then the, the targeted savings. And it's really up to you, Zara. For example, you may change what goes in there. In the beginning, Zara, so for example, and I'll use my daughter, she's doing this. She has a savings account because she wants to buy a house. So she might be putting like $200 every paycheck, okay? Or $200 a month. But her emergency savings, she needs to build up, okay? And so um, what she does is, uh, she may have more going into her emergency savings. She may be trying to save like three or 400 in there because she wants to build that up so she can have three to six months. But once she has three to, let's say three or four months, Zara, guess what she's going to do? She's going to switch putting as much in there and put more into what? The house savings, okay? So it all depends on what you're trying to do. Initially, Zara, you're probably going to put more, if not all, into an emergency savings because you really want to have that money set aside for an emergency. OK, but for example, we're in a pandemic now. So people who hadn't saved money, OK, um, people who haven't saved money, if they run into an emergency, they lose their job, they lose, maybe their hours get cut back. If they don't have that money, they can run into a lot of trouble. They could be, be evicted. They could have their car repossessed. They could be foreclosed and lose their house. So a lot of times the best thing to do is save that emergency savings first or put most there. And then once you've built that up, then direct more towards your targeted savings, okay? All right, great question. All right, Shana, I see it. I'm not sure if anyone can hear me, but I have a question. Would you recommend paying off debt slowly like every month or paying it off at once? I always hear different things about this. Very good question. Shana, what I would say is it all depends on the same question I answered for Zara. I would be very careful about paying off a lot of my debt quickly until I have my emergency savings. And here's why. Let's say I get a bonus on my job and that bonus is for $2,000 and I have a $1,500 credit card bill. Now, if I pay off the credit card bill, I'll save myself a lot of interest. But if I don't have much of an emergency savings and I take that whole 1,500, I take 1,500 of the 2,000 and I pay off that credit card, 
what happens if I run into an emergency and I and it costs me 750? I've got to go back and put some of that back on that credit card. So to answer your question, I would try to pay debt off as quickly as possible, but I want to make sure I'm balancing that with savings. I don't want to rush and pay off the debt and have no money in an emergency savings because an emergency savings can keep things from spiraling out of control. You know, sometimes when you run into a difficult situation. Also regarding the emergency fund question, do emergency fund accounts have higher rate? No, um, the, oh, good question, Sarah. When we call it an emergency fund, the bank doesn't call it that. You're just giving it your own title for what you want to use it for, okay? They don't care what the savings is. It's based on what you're calling it. So those names, you might say Sarah's emergency fund. So you know this is money you're putting aside to use for emergencies that happen. And then you have Sarai's house fund. You say that's for saving for my house. So what we call it emergency rainy day, that's your own title you give to it. So the rate that, that you get that, that it earns doesn't depend on anything but the, what the bank pays. It's not going to change. What age would you recommend? Uh, let me get Bethel's question. You guys have tons of questions. I love it. What age would you recommend getting a credit card? I wouldn't say a specific age, Bethel. It all depends on how mature the child is, okay? If I had a child like you who was wise and, and very smart and, and able to understand, I might help you get a credit card at 18 or 19 if I know that you're going to use it wisely and I want you to start establishing credit at a young age. I might do that. Now, if I have a child that doesn't understand and they might run out and put four or $500 on there and I know they can't pay it and I have to pay it, I might wait till they're 22 and come out of college. I didn't establish any credit till I graduated from college, okay? So Bethel, to answer your question, it all depends on the maturity of the child. Some kids at 18, a parent can begin to help them establish credit and say, hey, I know you're responsible. I'm gonna help you get a credit card. Or, you know, once you're working and you get a little credit card, I don't mind because I know you're only going to put uh, essentials on there and you're going to make sure you can pay it back. So it all depends. Guys like you, students like you, um, scholars like you guys, I think most parents would trust you at a younger age. Other folks, I wouldn't. Okay. Um, okay. I see great advice. Does paying off uh, debt at once affect your credit differently than paying it off every once okay no uh well here's the thing if you keep paying on it every month okay that's going to re be reported as being paid on time now where it can affect you shana is if it's a credit card debt if you pay it all off like i shared earlier i think with with um uh, caleb it'll raise your credit score okay because you'll pay it down under the 30 percent okay but if you pay it all off and you don't have any more things reporting saying paid is agreed, then it's, your credit score won't continue to go up. So there's kind of benefits to paying consistently on time and paying stuff off. But there's always the benefit when you pay stuff off of saving on interest. Does it look bad to have many credit cards or many different loans? It's not so much it looks bad, but it can affect you. Very good question, Shana. If you have too many credit cards, a lender may think, wow, they have $200,000 in credit card limits that they could tap into. So if you haven't used them, it doesn't so much look so bad, but I wouldn't do that because that's very tempting. But if you don't have any balances on there, it doesn't look too bad. Now, if you have a lot of loans, that can be bad because a lot of loans means you have a lot of loan payments. Remember, a credit card could be at zero and no payment, but a lot of loans that have balances means you have a lot of payment. How quick does your credit score update? Generally, the credit score, great question, Caleb. Your credit score is generally updates. It's usually about 30 days behind. So where in April, it may be reflecting stuff that happened in either February or March, okay? So generally it's a month, it's 30 days behind. So you may see that the last reported item on your credit report was in February, now that we're in April, or it might be something that reported in March. It's not real time. The stuff in April generally will not show up on your credit bureau until May, maybe June. Very good question. Um, one other question. Um, would you recommend like 18 year olds uh, creating like an I, I, IRA account? Um, at 18, an IRA, I wouldn't, I wouldn't probably do an IRA that young, Sarah. I mean, if you wanted to, to start an IRA is an individual retirement account. Um, generally at 18, I wouldn't be looking to do an IRA. I would just put my money in a savings account because an IRA, first of all, you know, you have to be having pretty steady income. 
And an IRA has penalties if you take it out. So I wouldn't do an IRA, okay? I would generally stick my money in a savings account right now at 18. I would, at 19, 20, I would stick my money in a savings account. And then Sarah, when you go to work for a company, generally most are gonna have a 401k, a few will have pensions, but I would make sure and use a 401k because an IRA is generally saving for retirement, okay? A 401k, you can do the same thing and a lot of times the company is matching. So I do a 401k, but I put my money in a savings account. Okay, I wouldn't do an IRA at 18, okay? And so would it be wise not to take any job interviews until it updates? Well, it all depends, especially as a young person. Um, and I forgot who asked that, um, Caleb. No, Caleb, I would take a job interview because they don't expect that you have any credit. In fact, some jobs, depending on how young you are, they may not even pull your credit because they think, okay, you're young. So I would not go on an interview, okay, uh, until it updates. Uh, uh, because even if your score drops a little bit and, you know, you go on a job interview, okay, by the time they get to pulling it, it may have updated by then. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't hesitate to go on a job interview with regard to the credit. Because remember, Caleb, if your score is just low because you've run up your, your, your credit card for a minute, okay, um, then once you pay that down, it's going to bounce back up. It's rare that, you know, you happen to be interviewing and they pull your credit right at the same time. And you guys are so young, most places are going to assume you have no credit. So they're generally not going to pull your credit at your age. But when you graduate from school and you're a little bit older, some of the jobs you go to interview for will look at your credit. Okay. All right. You guys have been great. Would you say the same about investing? I'm planning on going back to college though. Um, or work full time. All right. Um, no, investing, Shana, I would say, you, you know, if you can, if you have a steady job with a little bit of income, I would start investing as young as possible because investing, the most powerful thing for investing is time. So there are things like Acorn is a, is a great app where you can start investing five or $10 a month in a mutual fund. I think that's good. Or you can have it round up off of your debit card. As long as you have a consistent income uh, that, you know, is going in and you want to start saving 10, 15, $20 every month into a mutual fund, I would go ahead and say, Shana, start uh, at 18. Nothing wrong with that, you know, as long as you have consistent income. But Shana, the one thing I will say, before you start investing, investing is different than saving. You want to have your money in some savings first, because if you need to touch your investments, remember investment, I'm thinking of things like the stock market, mutual funds, the market could be down. And if you take your money out when it's down, you're going to lose money. So you want to make sure you have your savings first to cover any emergencies, and then after you've built up your savings, Shana, then you can do things like use, um, you know, go ahead and use uh, uh, Acorn and other little investment apps, or just invest monthly into a mutual fund or something. But make sure you, one, save first, and make sure that you're maximizing a 401k. If you're working a job, make sure you're putting into that first before you start any other investment. Mohammed, I don't understand your question. What would you say is good? I'm not sure when you say- A good credit score. Oh, a good credit score. All right, oh, excellent. All right, a good credit score, um, generally what's considered a good credit score um, is generally anything in the 700, say anything from 720. Credit scores go from 300 to 850. So anyone, anything from 300 to about 600 is, is poor. From, uh, from about 600 to 670, 680 is fair. 670 to like 720, and I'm giving rough estimates, uh, would be considered good and excellent as anything like 740 and above. So you want to get into 700. 740 and above would be considered excellent credit. Anything from about 650 to 750, would 730 would be good, okay? 700, generally, if you're in the 700s, you're good to go. Isabel, they've got tons of questions. I love it. No, I love it. I know you guys were a little over time, so I don't want to keep everyone. Um, if you have anything pending, put in the chat. But I do, before everyone hops off, um, I want to put two survey links in the chat. And Diego's going to help me with this. Um, we do a post-event survey, so please do complete that before you log off. It's a quick, like, five-minute um, max survey um, about this event specifically, so we can keep doing future events like this, whether it's on finance or bringing other guest speakers, really just to help you all. Um, but we want to hear from you before we either do stuff or don't do them again. 
Um, and then the second one is actually going to be, I'm really going to push college students to do this. And if high schoolers, you have time, we'd love for you to complete as it. well. It's about recruitment. So as you guys know, we start recruiting for new classes of CI scholars. And so we're thinking about different strategies for that. Um, and so we'd love your feedback just to hear about how you kind of heard about CDI, um, what you think we could improve on, um, and that'll help our scholars team. So please do complete those. Um, can we get the PowerPoint? If Sean's okay with saying that over, we can pass it along. If not, we're going to process this recording as well um, and make it available to you. Yeah, all. no, you absolutely you could have it. Do you want okay. me to send it to perfect. you? Yeah. Or, okay, I'll send it to you, Isabel. Yeah, that's perfect. All right, you guys have a great evening. Take care. Thank you so much, oh, Sean. Do you, me make you make, do you need me to make you the uh, host back? Thank um, you. I should be host. Let me double check. Yeah, you're good to go. All I right. have to send it. Yep. Take care. You're yeah, very I'll welcome. I'll stick around for anyone who still needs these links. Um...